Weiss, an economist, is we're doing this work. Um, I became an economist because I was interested in improving the quality of life for folks in neighborhoods like the one where I grew up. And make a really long story short, I thought economics was the way to do it, to help with job growth and, and so on and so forth. I started teaching at Harvard in 1983 at the Kennedy School of Government, where it's all about public problem solving. And I was teaching state and local economic development policy, which is about um, how to get businesses to, to come to an area, to expand in the area, how to get people matched up with jobs really well. And education kept coming up. Turned out when you do surveys of business people, the quality of the local labor force is the number one reason that they put their businesses where they do. Uh, even when we teach microeconomics one-on-one, -on -one, how many have ever taken microeconomics one-on-one? -on -one? <laughs> okay, so you, you've heard of, of the marginal productivity theory of wages. That how much people get paid is equal to exactly how much they add at the margin to, to, to how much the business is making. So I pay you exactly what you're worth, what you've added just at the margin. And if you're inframarginal, you're not the last person, I make a little profit on you, but I just break even on the last person. Okay, and so that theory of wages says that really your skills matter because how much you contribute to profitability depends upon what you can do. Well, where do you get those skills? A lot of it you get in school. Okay, um, so there are a number of different things that led me to conclude by the end of the 1980s that education is actually the most important economic development policy we have. Okay, we might talk about business attraction, we might talk about a number of other things, which are all important, but preparing the workforce, the human capital piece, is the most important piece. And so that's why during the 1990s, I gradually moved over doing more and more education work, and that's almost all that I do right now. But uh, in addition to sort of wanting to help the neighborhood, so to speak, um, all of us also have families. At one point, my grandma, my aunt said, oh, Ronnie, you just, you just studying your brothers. <laughs> okay, uh, two of us did, three of us did fine and two of us did not in, in our family. Um, and um, so I have a brother who's a physician. I have a brother who uh, was on the U.S. karate team for 15 years and is a small businessman in the neighborhood where we grew up. I also have a brother who's deceased because of drug and alcohol problems, and I have another brother who's not deceased, but who still has cocaine abuse problems, and whose son I raised. So I raised three kids, one by birth, one by adoption, and one by a brother. Okay, and so for all of us, there's a family piece to this, too. Okay, and part of what, part of the reason we're so interested in CTE is that it helps us to provide alternative and additional opportunities for a lot of our kids for whom college is probably, particularly four-year college degree, is probably not the best fit. Right now, we're trying to expand and raise the profile of CTE now, so even some of the kids for whom a four-year college is the best fit can still benefit from having some CTE exposure and maybe even specialization. But particularly for the ones for whom that's not a good fit, we need additional options. Just let me ask you, how many of you in here have at least one child in your extended family for whom a four-year college degree is probably not the best answer? Okay, so most of us. Okay, I've actually got one at home, <laughs> okay. I've got a 20-year-old at home um, who we're still trying to have make the connection. I've got two that are out of college who are doing just fine. One's in real estate consulting, the other's in the fashion industry in New York. But I've got one at home that we're still trying to help through, through this transition. Okay, so for all of us, it's professional, but it's also personal, right? And so I want to start off, um, I have a collection of poems for teachers uh, that I've done over the last 15 years or so. And I'm gonna want, read one that I wrote on an airplane on the way to a conference in California on these kinds of issues. And um, I actually wrote one this morning that I'll read later. <laughs> um, but this one's called Searching for the Stairs. And this is about a kid from a middle class family. I grew up pretty sure that someday I would go to college, but I tried. College didn't work for me. Tried to make it work, but did so poorly in my studies, I had to leave the university. Now I don't know what to do. And time is passing by so quickly, I despair to contemplate my destiny. What am I supposed to do when everybody in my family went to college and has got a big degree? 
What am I supposed to do when everybody says that college is the only way to get where I should be? I'm asking you these things because I really need to know if there's some hope that I can find my own career. I'm asking you these things because they say that you're somebody who can help me push myself and persevere. Please help me find a way to keep believing I'm somebody other people can respect instead of fear. Help me find a way to get invited to the party instead of being told to disappear. I thank you in advance for helping me to find a pathway. People say that you're someone who really cares. I thank you in advance for letting people in high places know that kids like me are searching for the stairs. Okay, so lots of us are trying to... Go. All right, so I'm going to start off with a few ideas, then put some facts on the table, and come back around to some ideas. Okay, and in a sense, where I'm going to end with the ideas is a kind of call to action. Um, a lot of the things, that we're kind of figuring out how to do them, but we need to stay inspired to actually do them, to close the knowing-doing gap. And we also need to be able to inspire a lot of people other than ourselves to, to invest the time and energy and effort to, to actually get this stuff done. Um, I, as you heard in the intro, I had one, of the, one of the hats I wear is, is head of the Achievement Gap Initiative at Harvard. And the, the slogan or the tagline for the Achievement Gap Initiative is excellence with equity. That we, and its privilege is excellence, but it's with equity. Okay, and the notion of what the goal is in that context is something that we call group, excellence with group proportional equality. Okay, excellence with group proportional equality. And so if we think that we, kids tend to be under a bell-shaped curve for most of the metrics that we care about for test scores and so on. Just a footnote, let me also just throw in here. We talk about how many jobs will require certain kinds of degrees. Jobs require skills, <laughs> right? And so sometimes we talk about having so many, you know, we've got to get more high school graduates, more, more two-year college graduates, more four-year college graduates. We've got to put our kids to have the skills, whatever the degrees are. The correspond. If we could give them enough skills by the time they finish high school, they don't need the rest of it. They just need to run out and, and use those skills. And so keeping the focus on skills and even understanding how certificates sort of uh, guarantee or certify that you have the skills, but it's about the skills and the dispositions and so, you know, the attitudes and so on that we really need to stay focused. And so you might say the B and, B and H there might stand for black and Hispanic kids and some kind of skill on the axis, and this could be the distribution of the skills in the society. And we, the W might be white kids, and white kids are a bit ahead. We often also don't remember there's a lot of overlap in those distributions. There are a lot of black and Hispanic kids who do better than a lot of white kids, and, and, and so on. So, but the central tendencies are different. We have different means, and we talk about closing the gap, we're talking about bringing those curves together. But we don't want to bring those curves together by bringing the red curve back. Okay, we don't want to slide, and we don't even want to hold the red curve con constant. We want to move it ahead, too. So the idea is we want to take both those curves and move them to the right so that they end up together on that green curve. And that green curve is what we might call excellence. Okay, it's further up in terms of the skills than either of the first two curves is. And both groups are now on that same curve. And so that's what we call group proportional equality with excellence, or excellence with group proportional equality. Okay? We're higher up for everybody, and knowing somebody's race or ethnicity in that picture or the green line tells you zero about what their skill level might be. And that's the aspiration. Nationally, with the little kids, with the, with the, ninth, with the nine year olds, with the fourth graders, over the last 30, 40 years, we've been generally trending up. And black and Hispanic kids have been turning up faster than white kids nationally. But even white kids have been turning up. That's the kind of movement you want in order to get group proportional equality with excellence. Okay, everybody's higher, but they all meet up at a really high standard. They haven't met up yet nationally, but they're trending in that direction. It kind of stops and starts, but that's the direction. With our teenagers, particularly with our 17-year-olds, there's been very little progress at all since 1990. Okay? And so it's almost as if the floor has been rising the nine-year-olds are coming up, but by the time they're 17, they aren't any better off than they have been. So the distance from the floor to the ceiling's been, been reduced, which means they're learning less in high school. They're squandering the earlier gains. 
And so we've got to find a way to do high school better because we're doing high school the way we always have. Part of doing high school better is to do really good CTE. Okay, and part of it is to do the, be do the rest better also. But we got to get better at how we work with our, older, with our mid to older teens so that we don't squander the good work that's being done at the earlier levels um, to, to bring kids up. Uh, in a way, what we're talking about is trying to find ways to, to harvest latent potential. In the big picture, we're trying to harvest the latent potential of a nation, of, of all of us. Okay, as you heard a little while ago, uh, we've been slipping behind for a while. We don't lead the world anymore in these educational categories. But we could. We're not that far behind. And it's a matter of trying to figure out how we bring all of us up. Okay, Minnesota is, is leading in a lot of ways, but everybody needs to get better. The saying by Robert Schuller, any fool can count the seeds in an apple, but only God can count the apples in a seed. That's the latent potential piece. The apples in a seed are, are latent potential, and we have to cultivate to get it. We have to do it on purpose, so we won't get it all um, by accident. And so it's a lot about doing the work, and doing the work with all of our various hats on. Think, who are we? What are the roles that we fill. It's not just in your job. Okay. We're parents. We are educators here today. But we're also citizens and leaders in various ways. And we're trying to get employers excited. We want them to authorize, enable, encourage their employees to become more involved in supporting schools in ways I'll come back around to, to a bit more after a while. But it's really movement time. Okay. I talk about the movement with excellence, movement for excellence with equity. Um, here we're talking more about what we call the pathways movement. At Harvard, we put out the report Pathways to Prosperity a couple years ago. That's been a part of this whole national discourse on things. And we also, even though we're talking about CTE here, which is mostly the older teens and kids on into college and and so on, kids. Start early. I mean, every age matters. There is no throwaway period in life. There's developmental work that needs to get done during each period. So we've got the prenatal period. Turns out we're learning now kids are encoding sound patterns prenatal. Okay, they come out of the womb already having some sensibilities that affect their stress levels and, and so on. And then once they're born, they're particularly taking it, taking it all in, so we got to get people to talk to their children. One person said, we just narrate life, because kids are learning those sound patterns, learning the speech patterns, and there are ways to communicate with kids before they can talk, like pointing turns out to be really effective. There's really good uh, research on gesturing. Eye contact and pointing at what you're talking about helps accelerate comprehension. And so we have a project called Seeding Success where we talk about the fundamental five. I guess I should tell you quickly what they are that's so, since I mentioned it. Right? The first of the fundamental five is maximize love, minimize stress. Okay, for infants. We're talking about kids zero to three. The second is talk, sing, and gesture a lot because they're picking up the sound patterns and so on. The third is use number games to lay the foundation for numeracy. Okay, we talk about literacy, but there are intuitions that go with mathematics that we can start with number games. The fourth is encourage and enable spatial exploration. Just moving around in three-dimensional space, developing in that mind's eye is going to be useful for mathematics and handwriting and sports. Okay. And the fifth is uh, read a lot, but don't just read. As soon as they can get to the place where they can discuss and give you some feedback, discuss. Higher order and lower order. And the, the mnemonic for higher order reasoning is remember, explain, anticipate. So you're talking to an 18-month-old or a two-year-old who, two who can give you some feedback. Okay, so remember, explain, anticipate. Those five things, there's really good research evidence that they affect early childhood development, and they can help us stop achievement gaps from opening before they start. Okay, there's a chart that I have in here. I think here on the next page, it actually shows at age one, and I'm going to go fast enough that you won't completely digest this, but just the picture I want you to see. At age one, these are different... Uh, the stripes are for children of parents at different education levels, all the way from any graduate education all the way down to less than high school. You see very little difference around age one in the kinds of things we can measure in a thing called the Bailey test. 
but by age two, the differences are stark. Okay, so we got to start early, early childhood, and those five things I just listed off to you, I'm suggesting if we can saturate communities with that kind of stuff where everybody knows it becomes the new normal in how people interact with little kids, we can make a lot of progress so that by age two, it looks more like the diagram for age one. Okay, stop it from opening before it starts. So as we go up through those age ranges, you got the zero to three that we're talking about now, we got the three to five, the preschool preparation, the five to nine, the learning to read and getting those basic math skills, the nine to 14, the taking on some identity, where it starts the career identities can start to come in. There are also basic pre-CTE kinds of activities. The uh, 14, 14 to 18, the high school years, the 18 to 25, every one of these periods has important work to do. None of it's throwaway work. And so we need to encourage our colleagues to be inspired to do their best at whichever age group they're working with, and then we do what we can do where we are. And if everybody does their job, then everything turns out a lot better than it otherwise might be. Uh, the goals are things we can pretty much all agree on. Okay, basic reading and math skills, love of learning, self-control, sense of purpose and responsibility, determination, growth mindset. In other words, understanding you can get smarter, the brain's like a muscle. College or career readiness, good citizenship, and so on. We can agree, if, any, if we broke into groups and you brainstorm what are the goals, we'd all come up with pretty much the same list. But we gotta do the work. <laughs> we gotta make sure it happens, we have to do it well. In, in a number of different ways. And so you can ask, well, what difference does it really make? Why is there such urgency? Well, a lot of the urgency is coming from the fact that a lot of our kids are being left behind. Okay, and with stories you've been told over and over again, the kids who don't have the skills are becoming surplus labor. You just don't need them that much. And not just the kids, but even the older people at this point. This chart here looks really busy, but the blue line is the one I want to focus on for a minute. These are, and actually the top of the chart is chopped off, so let me tell you what it says where you can't see it up there. This, workers with, this is workers with a high school diploma or less before bore the brunt of the recession's job losses. Job gains in the recovery are confined to those with education beyond high school. And this is all workers in the U.S. ages 18 and older. And so... The, um, the green line up there are people who have a bachelor's degree or better. And this is the beginning of the, the, the big recession we had. 2007 came down, you know, the recession that could have been a depression, but we, we dodged the bullet to some degree. People with uh, college education during that period didn't lose much at all. And there are a couple million jobs ahead by the end of 2012. People who have some college are the red line. They lost some jobs, about one and a half million jobs, but they've recovered, and they're pretty much back to zero where they started. People who have um, high school diploma or less lost 5.6 million jobs and have not, did not recover at all by the end of 2012 in terms of jobs. Okay, and there's speculation now that that may be a long-term condition. Okay, people figured out how to do without those folks that don't have a lot of jobs. There's another graph that tells pretty much the same story. This is, um, and again, the top is chopped off. <laughs> uh, un under underemployment um, for workers age 16 and older by education from 1994 through 2013. So. We got 1994 at this end of the graph all the way to 2013 at the under, other end. And it says, underemployment is measured to correspond to the Bureau of Labor Statistics measure as total unemployed plus all per persons marginally attached to the labor force plus total employed part-time for economic reasons. So basically, we're talking about people who want to work full-time but who can't find full-time jobs. Just all those folks. And we see that uh, we came through the 1990s, uh, underemployment dropped, things got better. Then we had a little recession during the early 2000s, it's that loop right there. Then we did better, then we had the big recession after 2007, and the four lines, the bottom line is bachelor's degree or higher. So those people, 
Didn't do too bad. They're not, not, not a lot of underemployment there. Some college, high school, less than high school education. Huge under, underemployment. And that's all workers, ages 18 or older, for the whole, whole society. Um, things are a lot worse for the younger people, for the, for the kids who are just out of high school. So for the kids who are just out of high school, I may have to keep reading the top of the charts here. <laughs> uh, the height of this bar, these bars are full-time employment, the full-time employment rate in the October following high school graduation for non-college enrolled youth from the classes of 2000 through 2012. So if you think about kids finish high school in the spring, go to the next October, take the ones who are not in college and ask how many of them have full-time jobs. So recent college graduates, it's October after graduation, what percentage of the group that are not in college have full-time jobs? And these are the numbers. That 19% in 2012 is a historic low. It's as low as it's ever been since we've been collecting the numbers. Okay. I don't know about Minnesota. <laughs> okay, your, your overall unemployment rate is among the best in the country right now at around neighborhood of 5%. But I would bet quite a bit of money that your kids in this group who just got out of high school, who are not in college, probably look quite a bit like this. It's, it's the national picture. And the question becomes, how can we avoid having so many young people in this position? Okay, if we break that out by race and ethnicity and gender for some kids, 5% for black males. Ninety-five percent of black males who just finished high school and are not in college do not have a full-time job. And it's not because they don't want to work. Okay, This is um, from a paper that just came out by Andy Sum and a couple of his colleagues at, at Northwest, North, Northeastern University in Boston, whose their shop puts out a lot of these kinds of numbers. Okay. Andy has been beating the bushes for a while trying to get people excited and concerned about the fact that our young people who are not our college goers are in a crisis. Okay. But it's easier to turn your face. <laughs> it's easier just not to look and to, to ignore this kind of stuff. But 5%? Okay, even for the kids, for white males, it's up at 26%. But that still means three quarters of them, 70, 74%, don't have full time jobs. Okay, so, how do they make a life? How do they put together something that, that actually makes sense for them? So, how can we build empathy? <laughs> and who's responsible to step up? This is the kind of thing where everybody can say, well, it's not my job. The fact that it is nobody's job is a, is a problem, right? Because they're not in the system. The other people whose job it is is kind of the family. And the families have no wherewithal to do anything about it. Okay. Um, as I mentioned, one of those kids is mine. I have a 20 year old who's home, who's got a job right now that's part time. So he's among the group that also is not part of that full time uh, labor force. The, um, one of the issues, I have a colleague who emphasizes that some of the problem is that we never tell kids when they go into high school, what it is they need to get out of high school. And for a lot of kids, the goal is graduation. Right? It's, you know, I've been in households in less advantaged neighborhoods where the mother starts to brag on the kid that they're proud of. And what they're proud of is he finished high school. Right? So this morning I wrote this poem. It's the first time I've ever read it aloud. <laughs> called, All They Said Was Graduate. <laughs> Vacant jobs, the big sign says. But nowhere do I see a way to get myself prepared so they can hire me. They told me if I did the work to graduate high school, I'd be prepared to have success and life would be real cool. I wonder why they lied to me. It really wasn't fair. Now here I am alone and broke, and no one seems to care. 
All they said was graduate, and that's just what I did. I did enough to pass each class. I was a real good kid. No one ever told me that I needed to get skills, that what I learned in school could someday help me pay the bills. All they said was graduate. I thought that was enough. So now I sit here clueless, worried about all kinds of stuff. If only they, they, if only they had told me that high school was preparation, a place to get the skills I need to find a good vocation. If only they had told me that I actually need to learn that mastery, not just passing, should have been my main concern. Maybe if some classes, maybe if some of my classes were more closely linked to working, I'd have more time, I'd have had more time on task and less just goofing off or shirking. And I know that lots of teachers said that I should go to college, but they never made it clear that to do that, to, that, to do that I needed knowledge. As kids, we count on grown-ups to help us find our way. When they fall down on that job, we sometimes tend to go astray. At this point in my life, I look for hope, reject despair, but it would help me, it would help me quite a bit if I could know you really care. So, um, you have to find ways to help those kids know we really care. And to give them a sense of purpose, a sense of possibility, images of possible selves that can keep them motivated and moving forward. CTE is among our tools for working to get that done. Um, this chart is one, if you think of, of the things on the axes as some kinds of skills. We have kids like A, who tend to be really good in one, not so great at the other. C, good, good in X1, not so great at X2. And then we have kids like B, who's not as good as either on either dimension. Okay, and those are the kids we worry about the most. All right, the ones who kind of get, they fall between the cracks. A lot of those kids who are not employed that we just talked about. And they look around and they say, everybody's better than I am at everything. They aren't an athlete, they're smaller, they're not as strong, they're not especially good looking. They just, on, on every dimension, they're kind of below average and we kind of deny their existence at times. Oh, no, everybody was really good at something. Some kids look, look around and they aren't especially good at anything compared to other people. And so how do we help that kid keep hope alive? How we say keep help them keep motivated enough to find the things that might work and sustain their effort to actually get it to work. Well, if we think that there's something in the world that needs to get done, it's out there at that green dot. Who's in the lead to get there? Right? A's not going there, C's not going there. There'd be something important in the world that needs to get done. It could have to do with something that needs to get done in the community, for the family. We don't know quite what it is. But we need to help every kid find their green dot. And then we need to support them as they strive to get there. And we can help just help every kid understand there was something you were put here on the earth to get done. We don't know what it is. Your job is to figure out what it is and to get it done. And whatever it is, you can get there with your skills if you keep building on them. Okay, not with the skills you got today, but if you build on those skills, you've got what it takes to get there because that's what you were meant to get done. Okay, and you've got to figure, it out, figure out what it is with other people's help. And if they don't give up, then eventually they reach success. Okay, and everybody kind of succeeds on, in their own way. Okay, my first year of graduate school, I was about equally prepared as other folks in my class at MIT, but there were some people who were way ahead. I had taken the graduate economic theory course as a senior at Cornell, but there are other people who seemed like they'd had the entire graduate curriculum already. You know, the statistics we were learning to do seemed like they'd actually written the programs to run those statistical things. Okay, and so 
I came up with this chart then for myself <laughs> as a first year graduate student so that I didn't have to feel worried that somebody might be ahead of me. And the issue was there's something that I'm planning to do, there's some purposes I have for being here that are a bit different from anybody else's. And if I just stay focused on my purpose, get done what I'm supposed to be here to do, I will get, I'll have what I need. And other people will have to do other things. Okay, and I'll bet you no money there's nobody standing on a stage doing this today who was in my first year graduate class at, at, at MIT. They're off each doing whatever their green dot is, right? And so we gotta figure out what our, what our green dots are. And I think there's some reality to that. It's not just a nice thing to, to say. And so what can we do? Well, there's a lot, and you're talking a lot, of the, about, a lot, about, a lot about those things here at the conference, but um, the notion of, of really cultivating a pathways movement I think, is a lot of what we need to do. We can unbundle that and say, well, what do you mean by that? Part of it's about cultivating commitment, <coughs> inspiring people, pushing folks to actually do the work, to stay committed. Part of it's about building the capacity. Conversation I had over lunch today with the folks I was sitting with, we were talking about not having the equipment and not having the instructors at all the schools to do some of the CTE work that, that needs to get done, right? And so all the work it's gonna take, the resources that it's, that it's gonna take to get, to, get, to get the equipment in the schools and to get the instructors with the appropriate skills to actually do it. So that's all about capacity building work. Okay, then actually supplying the opportunity, getting kids into the programs and matched to these opportunities to get the work done. And if we can do that, we stay committed, we build the system, we supply it, implement it, then we harvest the benefits from generation for generations. That's where we get all of the, the apples out of the seeds, so to speak. Okay, and so there's a kind of um, call to action that um, has several components beneath the, these major headings. Um, I think I'm going to jump a few slides ahead and then come back to, to that call to action piece of it because I want to go um, employers' roles in the pathway systems, and I'll come back to the slides I just jumped over. If we think about the pathway system being a system that leads young people from being sort of middle elementary grades, I'm a 10-year-old in fifth grade, to being a 25-year-old with a job. How do I get from here to there? It's like there's a road system that we hope also has cross streets, right? And we currently tell kids nothing at all about that system. So the future is like a dark tunnel. I can remember being in college, trying to figure out where am I going. I knew what I was interested in, but didn't quite know how to get there. So it's just like you're looking down a tunnel and it's black at the other end. And for a lot of our kids, the future is, is very much like that. And so, what role can employers pay, play in that? And there's lots of things we can imagine, so lots of, of roles, but beginning early on, there's a program in Boston called They Made It, So Can I, that brings people into fifth grade classrooms to tell their life stories beginning when they were in fifth grade. It's, and it's run by a student, the first, actually it was the third year I ever taught. I was teaching at Brandeis University and uh, one of the students who was in my class is the one who started this thing, Pat Patricia Spence. And she has about 80, 70 or 80 people, and they work with a cluster of elementary schools. And she takes them into the classrooms to tell their life stories, and she makes sure she has a broad range of people, cross-section. So she's got blue-collar, you know, truck drivers, mailmen or, or women, all the way up to, you know, really high-level professionals, brain surgeons. There's one guy who is a brain surgeon she talks about who... When he first goes in, he tells kids about how his foot, he was a football star. And he tells about everything except his career. <laughs> and then he finally drops in at the end, oh, and by the way, what I do now, I'm a doctor. I, I cut people's brains open, you know. <laughs> and so the, um, so having that, so by the end of the school year, every month or two, they've seen somebody like that. And imagine you did it for fourth, fifth, and sixth grade. The kids have a whole menu of possible selves with some ideas about what it takes to get there. And even if a kid is saying, I hate school, I'm never going to like school, well, one of the visitors said he hated school and he never liked school. 
and now he drives a UPS truck and he's got a family and he's in a sports league on Saturdays and he's got a good life. So there's a future here. And just in case I start to like school, there's somebody else who's doing something that requires a bit more school that's also a possibility for me. All right? So that's the they made it, so can I. And then there are other programs. There's one, the program that does what I'm about to say actually works with high school kids, but I think it's maybe even better for, for middle school, where you take kids maybe t twice a year to go to work settings during the day and talk to people while they're at work. See, what does it feel like to be in a real work setting? Okay, particularly in a kind of work setting that you never get to go if you're just a customer someplace. Okay, going through the door, because behind the meat counter at the grocery store, there's those doors. And people come in and out of those doors, but what's behind those doors? You know, so get to go back there and see where they cut the big slabs of beef that come in or where they store stuff before they bring it out. Or in the tall office towers that the kids never get to go into law offices and accounting firms to see what's happening in there. Or the, the, um, the warehouses on the highway, those long flat buildings, you wonder what's in there. You know, take kids those places twice a year during middle school to let them see what it looks like, what it feels like, and maybe some places where people from their neighborhoods work. So they get to talk to people who are from their same neighborhoods. And one of the women who runs the program that I have in mind here says employers really like to match kids with people who come from their neighborhoods. And people from their neighborhoods get pleasure out of interacting with kids from the neighborhood to tell them what, what the work life is like. Okay. Then imagine when you get to ninth and 10th grade, we start to bring people into the school to help the counselors. So I, we had the conversation over lunch today was you don't want to displace the counselors. You don't want to bring people who aren't qualified to do some of the counseling work. You don't want to have the system say, oh, now we only need one counselor <laughs> in the school instead of four. So you don't want to displace people, but there's probably not a high school in the country that's got enough career counselors, right? So we train people up a bit. We bring them into the schools to help out with the career counseling, to coach the kids on what they need to learn and get out of high school, to, to connect in a mentoring kind of way to some degree, but even if it's not as intensive as mentoring, it's informational, it's, it supports. Okay, imagine employers authorize people to get three, three, three hours a month paid to go into schools to do this kind of stuff. You know, get a little bit, little bit of training to do it. And then 9th and 11th and 12th graders, more options to combine work and learning to actually leave school a day a week, or there are lots of different arrangements for, for this. So initially, early on, I'm talking about just possible selves, giving kids exposure to images of possible selves that, that make sense and that are diversified enough so everybody can see somebody that they can relate to. In this particular program, they also have the kids write to the people who came to speak. So you can use writing at the end of the year. They can, talk, they can write about the person who they most identify with and why. Okay, you can link it back into the curriculum in various ways. Okay, and, and all this is aside from a lot of the mainstream stuff we talk about, when we talk about really aligning all the institutional corrections, connections, I mean, all the early college high schools and the, all, the, all those connections that we know we need that folks here are starting to put together. I had a student the year before last in Massachusetts in the Boston area um, go out and talk to a lot of people in GED programs. And I was, I guess I was surprised, maybe I should not have been surprised. Virtually none of the GED programs have any placement services at all. Okay, kids finish the GED, they get it, and then they're on their own. And the programs say, well, the reason is that we, we're not staffed for that. We don't have any funds to do any kind of placement. They don't have relationships with the community colleges, with employers. They're just kind of freestanding things. Unfortunately, a lot of high schools are like that, too. Right? Kids finish, and then they're on their own. So those connections. Now, to come back to the part I skipped over, this, this movement piece. So the cultivate commitment. So we're talking about commitment. To cultivate and promote a national pathways to prosperity civic culture that embodies a long-term commitment to excellence with equity in school, career, and life. So if we're trying to get people to buy into this, we're trying to cultivate that national commitment 
there's some guarantees that some folks are going to want. I know, obviously, you can see I'm a person of color. Communities of color are often very worried about this movement. You say, oh, you're just going to track our kids back into those low-level vocational classes. <coughs> okay, if you've been around long enough, you know that there was a big cutback in the 1980s on, on vocational education. That a lot of it was perceived as and was actually very watered down. And what we got during the 80s was the biggest bump in closing the achievement gap for our high school kids that we've had. Big jump. We got some progress in the 80s, 70s, but big jump in test scores for black and Hispanic kids during the 1980s. Okay, we actually, in the reading score gap, 61% of the gap between black and white kids in reading in the National Assessment of Educational Progress disappeared between 1971 and 1988. 61% disappeared, and most of that was during the 1980s. Okay, about a third of the math gap disappeared over the same period. People could argue that increasing rigor, partly associated with moving kids from vocational into college prep, is part of why we got that payoff. Okay, so some folks are worried that you're talking about more Vocational, now called CTE, now called career prep. More of that might be moving us back in the direction of taking the kids who struggle academically or who are suspected of not being smart and just sticking them back over there. So we've got to find ways to signal to the society that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about excellence. We commit to establish and maintain supports and accountability for high quality in all aspects of the pathway system. Okay, so we maintain excellence in the supports and the accountability. And there have to be metrics and ways to monitor and, and verify that we're actually doing that, right? Demographic, we commit to high quality supports for young people from every background and we explicitly reject any practice or process that might restrict opportunity based on racial, ethnic, or social class origins. So we've got to, to monitor the demographic, racial, and so on access to opportunity, and then career equity. We will encourage and enable each young person to explore a range of careers, and we will respect and support them in any career pathway they choose, including careers that usually require four-year college degrees and those that do not. Part of the challenge is making all work respected. Okay? My youngster who struggles, I said, just get somebody to pay you to do something. <laughs> you know? All work is honorable. Okay, if somebody's willing to pay you, you are adding value. Okay, and in my household, I can subsidize the whatever shortfall there might be relative to aspiration. Okay, but we have to, if, if we keep having such a strong hierarchy where only people who have a certain strata of jobs are respected and everybody else is demeaned or stigmatized, then the kids whose skills and dispositions best fit them for some of the jobs that might be stigmatized reject that because they don't want to do that. They don't qualify for the other piece, and so they're just hanging out there disconnected. Right? So we've got to find ways to talk and communicate um, about that piece with folks. So every career is equally respectable, and the criteria for choice of career is the one that best fits you. Right? the one that fits your interests and skills and aspirations and constitutes your green dot. So find your green dot. If nobody picked up the garbage, imagine what the world would be like. Okay, so we need somebody who likes to follow that truck around and pick up those barrels and dump them, right? And that's a respectable job. Okay, um, top of this that's chopped off. <laughs> build capacity, that was the second part. First was build commitment then the bill capacity. Create strong pathway systems directed by influential leaders who can help realize the pathway's vision at the regional, state, and national levels. We need our most influential people to put their reputations on the line, to put their weight on the line, and say, this, got, this has got to happen, okay? Public officials, we call upon public officials to help develop the policies, programs, and financial supports that's, that a strong pathway system requires. Get their attention, let them know what we want from them. Intermediaries, we must develop a national network of local, regional, and state intermediaries 
to recruit partners, develop collective commitments and strategies, and monitor progress. The intermediary part of this SIP picture is the part that's usually nobody's job. Okay. There's a bunch of system maintenance and coordination and communication functions that aren't assigned to any particular institutions. That's a layer in the system that's often missing. We have to create that layer in the system. And part of that is the job of our super elites to make sure it actually gets created. And a lot of it needs to be civic and not public because it needs to be sustained over time. It needs to, to survive the election cycle. So we need all the support from our elected officials. We need to hold elected officials accountable for not politicizing these arrangements and for supporting them over time in a stable way, supported by our, our highest level, most influential elites, the university presidents, the senior CEOs of the corporations, the hospital presidents, the, the elected officials. But again, mainly a civic sector, kind of intermediary role. Employers, we call upon employers to embrace the Pathways vision and to collaborate with educators to provide career guidance, world-class career education, and multiple opportunities for work-based learning. That's what we need for employers. Educational institutions, we call upon educational institutions at all levels to embrace a multiple pathways approach and to develop the capacity to offer excellence across diversi a diversified menu of options designed to help engage and inspire far more students. Okay, and so the institutions for which most folks in this room work, that's what we need from them. Research organizations, we call for national commitment to create the research infrastructure needed to inform, improve, and inspire the Pathways movement. Folks, I sat with at lunch today, I said, if you could set the research agenda or just fix some piece of the system, what would it be that we would work on? And they talked about how cumbersome it is to get Perkins money. <laughs> the hoops you have to jump through. Okay, and the need to figure out ways to streamline. Okay, you can imagine some research work being done to do comparisons across the nation and who's got the most streamlined but efficient and effective procedures. Bring that knowledge back, figure out how to retrofit it into what you've got already. Okay, that's intellectual work that needs to be done that sometimes it's nobody's job to do. Okay, so there's work for, for researchers and for folks to do that. And then the supply the opportunity. So build the commitment, build the capacity, and now actually deliver. And so supply opportunity, high, supply high quality developmental experiences along multiple pathways. So teachers, we will ensure that our youth experience high quality teaching not only in regular classrooms, but also in CTE and other forms of career education. So whatever it is, we need to supply high quality teaching. Some of you know that one of my hats is the Tripod Project. We supply ways to poll kids on what they're experiencing in the, in the classroom and then feed that back into the school so that they can use that to, to refine the kids' teach, kids learning experiences in school. And there's this huge variation inside almost every school. Okay. It's not unusual to have some classrooms where one or two kids out of 20 will rate the class favorably on most dimensions of instruction. And other classrooms where almost everybody rates the teacher favorably. And the class is right next to each other. <laughs> okay. The question is, how do we get people the feedback? Because sometimes we're not doing well, but we don't know that we're not doing well. Okay. And so we need to, to develop those systems and maintain them. So really high quality teaching in CTE and in every phase. On-the-job supervisors, so once kids get the jobs, we will insist that on-the-job supervisors nurture excellence and encourage the personal growth of all young people under their authority. So you're not just saying, well, you didn't work out, get out of here, I'll hire somebody else tomorrow. You're actually investing. I mentioned my 20-year-olds in a job. I get the impression that they're actually investing. They're only giving him like two days or two and a half days a week, but he says what they said is when I really totally get the hang of it, they'll give me more hours. What it looks like to me is that they really don't need him. But they're a kid, he likes, they like him, they want to help him, so they're trying to give him more work gradually, but only when he doesn't need supervision. Right now, I'm guessing when he's there, somebody needs to be, have an eye on him, know what he's doing, be supervising him, so that's why it's not full time now. But we need more people to invest in kids in that way, to provide the support and appropriate supervision. So on-the-job supervisors, we need to reward on-the-job supervisors 
for doing a great job as, as nurturers to the kids that we place under their supervision. Counselors, there will be, be enough high quality career and life guidance in school and beyond. So counseling, not only in school, but beyond. Youth leaders, young people will mobilize to establish strong peer networks to advise adults and hold them accountable for following through on the Pathways vision. Okay. Kids can be pretty, pretty effective co-conspirators in this, including to undermine some of the things in their own peer culture. Just, I could talk for another hour on the degree to which kids are trapped inside their own peer culture. And we need to help them break out of that trap. Most of them have really positive values, but they don't know all the other kids have really positive values because the other kids don't act like it. Okay, and all of them act like they don't have the values that most of them do have. Because each of them is trying to fit, fit in. There's a, there's a conception called pluralistic ignorance. That's when people misread one another's values and preferences and then change their own behavior to fit in with the other people whose values and preferences they have misread. Okay, and I could show you evidence that that's what's going on in teenage youth culture today. So we don't have to change their values. We have to change their, oppor their social opportunities to live out those values which it might be easier than changing their values. Okay. When we watch them, we think we need to change their values. But their values aren't consistent with their own behavior. Okay, so keep going. Um, linkages, institutional linkages instead of disconnected silos will foster alignment between institutions and this will enable smooth transitions from high school to post-secondary institutions and from education to work. Linkages will also enable transitions from one opportunity pathway to another for those who decide to change direction. So those are those cross streets in that system we talked about. And community supports. Families, friends, and associates will value and respect each young person as an individual. They will appreciate that every young person has a distinct way of fitting into the world and needs to find his or her own opportunity pathway. Okay, and so we put all those things together. We put the call out, we push, get lots of people excited. We got a movement, <laughs> we've got hope. We can get some things done. And the nice thing is there's already a lot of momentum on, in this direction uh, around the country. And so um, I'm going to end with uh, another poem. Um, this is a poem I wrote for high school teachers who get impatient with their kids. <laughs> Got any of those in the room? <laughs> okay. Going to have my dinner at my grandma's house today. My mom's is staying late for work to make some extra pay. Got a lot of homework, but I'm worried about my mom so that it makes it hard to concentrate. My mind feels like a bomb. Also got to make sure I wash some clothes to wear and I got to get that stuff I need to tame my crazy hair. And while I'm doing that, I'll use the phone to make some calls for... Got lost. <laughs> while I'm doing that, I'll use the phone to make some calls to tell my friends the time and place for Friday at the mall. And sometime between now and then, I got to get some dough because I ain't going to the mall all destitute and poe. <laughs> I know. I should focus on that test I got in math. But my English paper is due soon, too. I need some help real bad. Some teachers think I just don't care. Some think I'm not trying. I think I'm caught in a trap. Sometimes I just start crying. But no one ever sees my tears because I just show the tough side. I like to seem real in control, if not book smart, then streetwise. I wish my teachers understood what it's like to be me, to see my life the way I do, the whole complexity. They see how hard it is to keep so many things in focus. They see how blurry things can get, how stuff can seem so hopeless. My teacher said I best to be ready when I take that test in math, but I ain't got no help at home. Never knew my dad. I want to go to college, but for that I need good grades, and based on what my grades are now, there may not be a way. I don't know what I'm going to do. I need someone who's wise to help me figure out which way to turn, to empathize. But let me stop daydreaming, because I got a lot to do. If I don't start my homework soon, I never will get through. If I try and still can't do it, well, just won't hand it in. But if I don't try, I'll never know. So here goes, I'll begin. Every day I pray to find someone to guide me and to care. Is there any chance that you could be the answer to my prayer? I'm done. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>